welcome everybody. Welcome to our webinar today, the third of our Eco Church topics. And today's webinar is all about how you can work towards net zero carbon with Eco Church. So how the two things mesh together. Uh, the usual quick bit of housekeeping at the beginning. So we will do questions in the Q&A rather than the chat. So if you move your mouse around, you'll see the Q&A option. If you click on that, that's where to type any questions that you have. And you'll also be able to see everyone else's questions. And so you can do a thumbs up next to a question that you like and the ones with the most ticks move to the top. And that's where we'll focus our time at the end when it gets to, to the end of Helen's presentation. Um, after the webinars, I send everybody the slides and any links that are shared in the chat. Uh, and then a few days later, um, once I've got it processed, then I put the link to the recording on our web page. So the same page where you booked to come to the webinar, uh, you'll be able to find the recording there. I know this is a slightly daunting slide. This is all the webinars we've got coming up. This is our program between now and December. Um, I will skim through them because I know there's far too many there for me to read them all in detail. But we've got three different kinds of webinars between now and Christmas. We've got a repeat of these eco church ones. So if you've either missed a topic or if you've left and thought, oh, I really wish my colleague had been there, Helen's running these for us again uh, toward the um, middle of September onto the beginning of October. So we've got those three eco church topics getting started, uh, working towards an award and a repeat of today's one on net zero carbon. We've then got our whole series of net zero uh, webinars. So we've got heat pumps, really important couple of sessions on fundraising. I know that's a real issue for a lot of people. Uh, schools and then conservation pitfalls. So particularly if you've got a you know a historic or a listed building, uh, getting to yes for your environmental projects. This is a new topic that we've just listed, and it's all about how to navigate the faculty system successfully if you've got an environmental project. And then we've got a new topic again on assessing embodied carbon. So that issue of um, all the carbon and the materials that go into doing a project on your building. How how do we understand that issue? And a brand new series tied in with the season of creation in the autumn, which are around uh, worship and liturgy and music and how the environment weaves through those. So we've got our Forest Church one, climate, the theology of climate change, let all creation sing and climate action is mission. Once I've finished the housekeeping, I'll put the links to those webinars in the chat and they'll also be in the follow up email that you get. So you'll have time to read through the topics and decide which ones are relevant to you. But more importantly, uh, is on to the main event today, which is to hear from Helen Stevens. If you haven't been to the previous two topics, just so that Helen Stevens is, is absolute wealth of understanding and knowledge about the Eco Church programme. She works for Russia UK, the charity behind Eco Church, and is the church relations manager. And in that role, she's seen hundreds of churches work through the Eco Church programme. Uh, so be ready with your questions and, and confident that if anyone knows the answer, it'll be Helen. Uh, and if you haven't come across me before, I'm one of the staff at the Church of England working on the Environment Programme. I'm inside the Cathedral and Church Buildings Division. Right, let me stop sharing my screen and hand over to Helen to share her slides and lead us away. Oh, well, thank you, Catherine. I can just hear my laptop whirring away in the background, so apologies um, if you if you can hear that. You do there we go. Slight buzz, but you're but you're very audible. Just a, just a slight buzz when you speak. Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Well, it's lovely to be with you um, this afternoon from all around the country, as you were sharing in chat. Um, I don't mind admitting that of the three webinars in this series, this was probably the one that I was least looking forward to, but actually I've really enjoyed um, prepping for it. So I can only hope that it is helpful uh, to you today. Just in terms of a quick overview, um, I'm going to start off by talking about where net zero fits um, in the context of Eco Church in, in the history of what's happened over the last few years. Um, why net zero carbon? And then the Eco Church framework and net zero carbon um, sort of interwoven. How are they different and how do they interconnect? 
I'm probably not going to answer those questions one after the other, but we'll rather try and highlight that as we go through um, the next uh, 40 minutes or so. And I will also cover off briefly um, two footprint into printing tools that you can use uh, both within EcoChurch and indeed as part of your um, journey to net zero carbon. So in terms of a timeline of events, uh, EcoChurch, um, many of you may know, was launched actually five and a half years ago in January 2016, and it preceded um, some of these uh, targets that have subsequently been set and that we're talking about today. Um, we never set a target around getting to net zero. Um, we don't see that as our role. We've, we've rather provided a framework that I'll go on to talk about. Um, but very much the whole of EcoChurch is about us reducing our impact on the environment, um, trying to make a positive difference. Another key uh, part in the timeline was October 2018, um, a much quoted report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, which found that um, human activities were estimated to have caused about one degree of global warming above pre-industrial levels. And we've already got that in our climate. It's, it's sort of baked in, if you like, for the future. Um, but what that report also highlighted was a pathway to trying to keep that temperature rise to within one and a half degrees um, of, of CO2 emissions. And uh, there were many projections in that, and I think that's where the key 2030 date has come from, um, because really the report was suggesting that if we wanted to keep it within one and a half degrees, uh, we needed to get there by 2030, and that that would require rapid and far-reaching transitions in energy, land, urban and infrastructure, and industrial systems, um, so really across every aspect of society. And then I guess in response to that and in response to um, the, the climate change that we're already seeing in February 2020, the Church of England um, General Synod passed a motion that sets the 2030 net zero carbon target. And apologies. <laughs> and then in April 2021, just a few months ago, the Church in Wales governing body um, passed a similar motion. They declared a climate emergency and they've also committed to net zero carbon emissions, ideally by 2030. I think they are sort of looking at um, what's, what's practical for them. Um, and I know there are other denominations that may not yet have got a 2030 target, um, but are um, certainly on pathways to serious um, emissions reductions. Why net zero? Well, I could have... Um, I guess quoted the, the Anglican five marks of mission, um, which are, are all very relevant for this, not least the fifth mark of mission um, to preserve the integrity of creation. Um, but I actually um, think this quote from Bishop Nicholas Holton, who has just retired as the, the um, lead bishop on the environment in the Church of England, um, I think this really sort of sums up why it's so important that we look at net zero and why it's there as a target. It is an ambitious target, but it is in response to the urgency of the climate crisis. And I think holding that urgency in mind as we go into this um, is really important. Um, and as, as it, he then goes on to say, um, it's not gonna be easy. Um, and I think, you know, we will, we will touch on some of that um, this afternoon, but it is an urgent call to action. It's a clear statement of intent, um, not just to the church, but across wider society about our determination to safeguard God's creation. He also went on to say that it's a social justice issue. Um, it affects the world's poorest, soonest and most severely. And we are already seeing that in many parts of the world and that we have to get our own house in order. Um, and that is what this net zero 2030 target uh, and indeed EcoChurch are all about. Um, there isn't, I think, any doubt that climate change is happening, that we are causing it, um, but we need to work out a plan to do everything that we can um, to try to meet this target. Well, EcoChurch then was, as I said, designed to provide a framework for action by which a church can take action to care for God's earth across five key categories of church life. 
And if you've been at one of the, um, or both of the previous two webinars, um, we've covered off in some detail how to get started um, and what EcoChurch is trying to achieve. I don't think it was ever intended to be an exhaustive list. Um, so there are things that we'll touch on with Net Zero this afternoon that you may not find directly in EcoChurch, but it provides hopefully enough examples of significant actions um, that can be taken in light of recognizing that it's God's earth, not ours, that caring for the earth is missional, and that the environmental crises that we're facing are very much as a result of our broken relationships with God and with the earth. And hopefully that framework uh, gives enough ideas that uh, there are other actions that, are, that can come from it. As I said earlier, it doesn't mandate a target, but rather it's about encouraging and promoting action through a progressive pathway um, of awards from bronze to silver um, and gold and onwards. Well, what is zero carbon anyway? I have unashamedly uh, borrowed um, Catherine's slide from her um, webinar on this, which I highly recommend. Um, and the first part of this is our energy usage. That is where um, our, our gross carbon footprint comes from. The energy use that we use in our buildings to keep them running. So our gas and our electricity bills. And the conversion factors are what are used. They're set by the government each year to convert um, that usage into a standard amount of tons of CO2 equivalent. It also includes um, the fuel that might be used for travel in relation to church business. So that is the majority of the church's gross carbon footprint. What we then take away from that to get to our net measure is uh, any renewable electricity that we might be using, either that we're using um, on the grid from, well, probably all on the grid, but either that we're using from um, an electricity provider and all that we might be generating on site ourselves through, for example, the use of solar power panels or a ground source heat pump. And then also recognizing that we uh, are likely to always have to offset um, an amount of carbon. Um, and it might be through um, a scheme such as climate stewards um, that fund projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, for example, by restoring forests um, or um, increasing the energy efficiency of buildings and transportation. So, and that really is for those reductions that are, um, let's say, almost impossible at this point anyway, for us to make ourselves. And then when you, sorry, I nearly forgot to finish this off. So you take those away and that is what uh, you're left with, the net carbon footprint. And that is what we are trying to get to zero by 2030. I've heard um, Catherine and Joe Chamberlain uh, refer to their respective roles about being, as being about bricks and mortar, in Catherine's case, and hearts and minds from Joe. Well, regardless of where you start with net zero, um, I honestly think you need both. I think they would both say that too. And I think the same is equally true of EcoChurch. So I'm going to suggest that we start with a hearts and minds approach um, and our worship and teaching, which is the first category of Eco Church, is absolutely um, what gets us uh, started and in the right mindset, if you like, um, that ecological conversion of our hearts and minds that Pope Francis um, so eloquently, eloquently talked, uh, writes about in Lodato C. Psalm 24 reminds us that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. He has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. It is not our earth um, and it's not only us who live in it, it's uh, millions of other species. It's also not only our earth for this time that we're in. Um, it has uh, obviously had um, people throughout history and we are hoping um, that there will be many more future generations uh, living on the earth. This uh, image was created by All Saints in Leighton Buzzard, 
um, they, uh, when getting started with Eco Church, asked their church um, what they understood by that verse from Psalm 24. Um, and I just think this sets a lovely tone for how we get started um, and how we might think about framing how we ask our churches to get to net zero carbon. So words like respect, um, uh, love, gift, sacred, future, responsibility, custodians, all of these words, if you like, are underpinning any actions uh, that we might take and hopefully will motivate us um, and ground us in taking action. So throughout worship and teaching, every section of Eco Church, um, sorry, throughout Eco Church, every section reinforces the whole. And in worship and teaching, we're encouraged to celebrate God's creation throughout the year, to recognise our place in it and our God-given responsibility to help restore it, and to pray for the earth. And then we'll be more likely to do this, to, to take the sustaining action needed to get to net zero. And this image is one that I think I shared at last week's webinar. Um, and I actually went away and read a little bit more about it. It's an altar cloth from Salisbury Cathedral um, who gained their Gold Eco Church Award recently. There's a, no, a whole narrative about what this represents, which is too detailed to go into now. But the overall image is of the tree of life, a reference to Revelation. And um, also of the actions of humans in the bottom part of this as having despoiled creation. Um, and then um, how uh, they wanted to show the understanding of God as three in one, how God as three in one permeates creation. So there is the spirit of God hovering like a dove and breathing life into it, uh, like a wind represented by silver and gold flecks. They've got three wind turbines in here and three crosses, um, which you can just make out um, below the sun. Um, and then the yeah, the light uh, showing uh, God as the source of life and love. And I just think looking at that um, and this being sort of part of their uh, Eucharistic worship, if you like, reminds us of this interconnectedness, which is so important and which we need to understand in our journey to net zero. And then moving on to the cross, which is, of course, about new life and resurrection. A promise which is for all of creation and just to um, remind you of what um, I'm sure is a memorable verse in Colossians it's uh, in fact the whole of um, these verses in Colossians 1 15 to 23 but verse 19 in particular for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things whether in earth or in heaven by making peace through the blood of his cross. And it's that reminder that Jesus died uh, for the whole earth so that all things might be reconciled. And what we're doing in our work through Eco Church and through trying to uh, radically reduce our carbon emissions is to work uh, in this story of restoration um, and redemption of the whole earth. The only specific question I want to draw upon from the worship and teaching section before we move on to buildings um, is the final question, and it is whether the leadership have made a formal commitment to improving the environmental credentials of our church by endorsing the undertaking of work towards an Eco Church Award. I think that is vital whether your church is going down the Eco Church route and indeed to get to net zero. We need that support. Um, and that endorsement from our leadership. I guess what I would say is that it's not necessary to get to net zero to an achieve an Eco Church Award, nor is it necessary to do Eco Church to get to net zero, but I hope over the next um, few sections that we'll look at that you'll see the ways in which the two are complementary. Eco Church provides a great holistic framework for a path to net zero, and net zero provides, I think, a great incentive and structure um, for helping us to, to achieve an Eco Church Award. Well, now, if you like, we're coming on to the bricks and mortar section. Um, this photograph is of Christchurch in Toxted Park, um, a photo that I use a lot. 
Um, they are also um, a gold awarded eco church. And I think what um, this always reminds me of is that our buildings are um, not just um, about the bricks and mortar actually, but also about um, the people and the services. Um, so I, I always remember hearing a talk by Do Dr. Robin Pender from Historic England, um, who talks about how we must learn to sail our buildings. And I think she uh, uses that image um, because our buildings are not, uh, in one sense, not static or benign. They are um, there to host us as people, um, to glorify God um, through our worship and in the services that we might be offering and putting on in our buildings. Not everything is possible or necessary for every church. And um, that is true of Eco Church um, in, in this section, just as it's true of your route to net zero. Um, the practical pathway to net zero, there's a, a lovely two page document on that, gives a good practical overview and steps to achieve it. I think it's important to emphasize or to re-emphasize if you've heard that webinar, that you will be on a different pathway depending on your church size and usage. Um, and this uh, example from Christ Church is an example of the creative way in which a church has tried to use its space to make the people comfortable and to put on its services. Um, making people comfortable in a, a carbon efficient way by choosing to put a marquee in the church and to heat and light only that um, marquee or tent, if you like, while they're having their services, rather than having to heat and light the whole building, which is not to say that they don't also have to do that um, to keep it at an ambient temperature to kind of keep the building in a good condition. But they are thinking about um, how the building and the services and the people um, all work together. Let me just pause because uh, I meant to say if you haven't uh, listened to the two webinars by Catherine, um, I really recommend them. A positive vision of a, zero, of a zero carbon church and defining the scope of net zero and lots of wonderful other webinars besides, um, some of which Catherine highlighted at the beginning, which can help you um, in particular with this buildings section. So um, an early amendment to Eco Church, I think it was in 2018, was to allow some questions in this section to be not applicable. So that's me reflecting back to you that we recognize that not everything is possible nor realistic for every church to do. So as an example, um, a grade one listed building um, might really struggle to get double glazing on it. But also please don't assume that these things are not possible because um, I'll touch on a few examples um, where different things have been achieved. But these first two questions in the building section are very much, I think, a good starting point for net zero, measuring our energy use and calculating the carbon footprint of our church premises and I'll touch on both of those tools shortly. And then setting sufficient targets for reducing the carbon footprint and achieving year on year improvements in energy efficiency, not necessarily energy reduction, but certainly any energy efficiency. And we are seeing now um, that 2030 net zero target filter through. Um, Salisbury Cathedral just recently have adopted that as the target they are working towards. Just a reminder, um, to put it in context again, what is zero carbon anyway? So you've got your energy usage, your direct energy usage um, that, you can, that you can pull off from your electricity and gas bills with those conversion factors. We'll talk about how you can put that into a footprint. Your reimbursable travel, that gives you your gross carbon footprint. And then taking off the renewable electricity um, that you might be sourcing um, and then carbon offsets that you might be purchasing and giving you your net carbon footprint. Sorry. So net zero um, can be reached through a combination of energy reduction saving measures and energy generation. Um, and we will touch on some of these um, now. And there may be on-site renewables in that mix of renewable electricity. Um, but that very much depends on your own church's um, circumstances. 
This again is from Catherine Slidepack. I simply wanted to touch on this to highlight um, embodied versus operational carbon. Now, I think it's currently and still the case that it's only operational carbon um, that is uh, that is within scope for this net zero 2030 target. But embodied carbon is also important um, because if we're going on to um, indeed build a new church or make any sort of refurbishment, then the way in which we do that will also have um, carbon emissions. Um, so albeit they're not in the target, they're still important to consider. So um, as an example um, of actually a, a building with relatively low embodied carbon, Salisbury, a cathedral which was built over 800 years ago, and um, because of the way in, that was, in which that was um, constructed at the time, which was very labour intensive uh, in the 13th and 14th century, um, they actually have a very low embodied carbon um, in the cathedral, but their operational carbon um, is very high because they have ordinarily thousands and thousands of visitors per year um, and they need to keep the lights on and keep the building heated. Um, and just to flag that there is a question in EcoChurch about embodied carbon um, or, or at least an inference to it um, in that if you do need to undertake a building or a refurbishment project then we're absolutely encouraging you to do that um, to the standards of BREEAM or a similar um, best practice in sustainable building design, construction and operation. So that's uh, why I just wanted to flag that. So you've got your operational carbon such as gas for heating and your embodied carbon such as in your building materials. You can tell these are Catherine's slides not mine, I've forgotten that was coming up. The energy footprint tool then um, was developed as a way of measuring the carbon footprint of your church based on the energy used to heat and light your buildings. So this was brought in last year by the Church of England um, and is now um, accessible um, via the online parish return system. Uh, and you can see there on the, um, on the, the little photo um, what it will give you in terms of the overall uh, carbon footprint of your church and the, the energy usage band that you come out in. Um, and I think churches are being, um, if not mandated, then certainly very encouraged, uh, and C of E churches that is, to complete the EFT. Now we don't link directly to this from the Eco Church website um, because, as I've said, the EFT is a tool for Church of England churches and Eco Church is very much an ecumenical scheme. So we've got churches uh, using it from all denominations uh, and it's, this is not applicable to everyone, but it is uh, incorporated or, or rather linked to um, the Climate Stewards tool, um, which is the one that Eco Church does reference. Um, that is a tool that was produced actually by Climate Stewards, but, but with, in conjunction with ourselves and with the Church of England, um, and also launched last year. Um, and this can be used by any church of any denomination um, and any size. And actually, it sounds like it's increasingly being used um, by other similar types of organisation um, because it is such a comprehensive tool. So in addition to our energy usage in church, it will also cover um, travel, um, flying. I can't imagine that there is much of that. Um, food if we're serving meals in our churches um, and then expenditure so emissions from our supply chain um, which we we often not got well we don't have direct control over but it may influence um, the decisions that we make about the types of goods and services that we are purchasing there's also a section in there about waste and water which um, climate stewards acknowledges is probably um, pretty tricky uh, to calculate because um, most, most organisations don't keep records of how much waste they produce. Um, so they've got some guidance in there about how you can come up with um, a best guess um, for your estimates of the amount of waste produced. And then you go through, uh, you, you register your church and you go through all the questions there. Um, if you have already completed the uh, your carbon footprint using the EFT, then I think that data um, can be used. You, do, you don't have to go and um, start again with your energy bills. It can be 
um, linked to the footprint being worked out here. So there is consistency between the two. Then it will give you um, your total annual emissions. Um, uh, so here in this example for 2019, um, you do need to, uh, as, as you can see here, you need to keep track of the number of people visiting your church and then it will give you an average carbon footprint per person. And I think that's really important too, because hopefully many of us will want to see our churches grow and our buildings be used um, for more and more services. Um, and that actually may uh, result in, uh, you know, an, in, an increase in our absolute um, emissions, um, but it's the efficiency that it's important trying to drive down that per person usage, whilst also trying to drive down the, the whole absolute emissions, but those two figures um, can work well there. And it will give you then, as you see on the, from the pie chart, um, the breakdown. So here, as for many churches, the majority of the carbon footprint is from that direct energy usage, um, heating, keeping the lights on, um, keeping our buildings open. Um, travel is, is um, actually a relatively high proportion in this particular church, um, waste and water much lower. In terms of the building's questions I'm, uh, in Eco Church, I'm not going to go through them um, one by one. Um, but to, to say it is the biggest section of Eco Church, so there are some, uh, I think, close to 30 questions by the time you take um, various buildings that you might have. So it starts with our main church building, but some of us may have separate buildings that are church offices. Um, we may also have um, a church hall and then um, clergy housing. So there are questions in there that relate to each of those types of buildings. Um, the same questions. So you'll be asked about insulation and double glazing and energy efficient light bulbs for any of those buildings that you might own. And if you just have one main church building, that's fine. You just answer for that one main church building. Um, insulation, just to highlight here then, in Salisbury Cathedral's gold submission, they mentioned the continuous and unglamorous work of draft proofing their huge 13th century building. So whilst they have gone on to put solar panels up in the last um, 12, 18 months or so, I think it is, um, they recognise that actually starting with, if you like, the basics of draft proofing uh, is really important. And I think the practical pathway to net zero um, will guide you along similar steps. Um, the questions are, are not ordered in Eco Church in a sort of path to zero way, um, but they uh, all contribute in different ways. You've then got double glazing in here. Um, and I, as I said earlier, there are not applicables in sections like this, but just to encourage you um, sort of not to give up. So Salisbury for their silver did put not applicable on the double glazing. When they came to gold, they then realized that actually um, they have in effect got double glazed glass because um, they've installed an outer layer of isothermal glazing to protect the stained glass from wind and water penetration. Um, which also helps to eliminate drafts and, and conserve the heat. Um, so yeah, just to say um, there are still often things that you can do and changes that you can make, um, even with uh, buildings that are perhaps harder to get faculty permission on. So just to say on there, there's um, we'll touch on a few more of these. You can see the new build refurbishment projects green question that I've highlighted there cycle racks which touches on the travel aspects, renewable energy generation uh, which you may get to but not every church will. And then um, one of Catherine's slides again, these have been so helpful, the energy audits that they've done within Church of England churches and I'm, I'm really I'm confident it would be very similar across other denominations, um, highlights the most uh, important areas for action and indicates, as indeed that pie chart from that carbon footprint tool did, that it's often heating that's the bulk of a church's energy use. So maybe focus on the highest energy uh, using building if you've got multiple buildings in terms of where to sort of target the biggest reductions. This lovely list of recommendations, so many of these are questions within Eco Church, but not all of them. Um, 
the first one I'm relieved to see switch to 100% renewable electricity um, because I think for the talks that I've done over the last few years in churches, um, that is the one that I always highlight in the building section. So start there and um, then go on to looking at LED lamps and fittings and maybe change them out over time. You don't have to do them all in one go. Um, again, something they did in Salisbury, um, they're working away at switching out all of their fittings in the main cathedral. Um, but for Christmas, they gave all their staff um, some LED uh, light bulbs, I think, one year to try and encourage them to um, change out the, the, the bulbs in their own homes. You've got things in here like heating controls and um, let me see, uh, heating controls. So you won't find that in Eco Church. Uh, nor will you find reducing background heating hours or temperature. Um, please appreciate if we included all of these, uh, if you like, um, maintenance uh, questions, um, the, the, the category would be double the size that it is. But absolutely, these things are really important um, to do as well. Um, Catherine uh, used this slide in her vision of a zero carbon church, um, the outside of it, and um, I think this is really helpful just to highlight to you where there are, <laughs> here we go, where there are um, similar questions in eco church. So we don't ask about a well-maintained roof or gutters in particular. Um, but LED floodlights, yes, there's a question about having a policy on minimising um, flood lighting and we recognise that many churches will need to have it. There are questions about LED bulbs. There are There is a question about um, collecting rainwater, having a water butt. Similarly about reducing heat loss from windows, questions about double glazing. Draft proofing is um, not a specific question as I said earlier. You'll find one about cycle racks. EV car, char car charging. Um, when Eco Church was first uh, introduced um, I think our cars hadn't quite um, caught, weren't quite at the point of um, being EV ready. But when we uh, next modify the survey, um, I'm sure that's an option we will look to include. Um, you may get to a heat pump um, if you've done an assessment and a ground source heat pump uh, seems like a, a reasonable and cost effective uh, modification. Um, insulating renders or external insulation um, is a level of detail beyond where we will go to, um, but solar panels also might be covered in renewables uh, that you might want to bring into your own church. Um, I've highlighted this, sorry, it's a little bit blurry, but from All Saints um, Eco Church survey, All Saints in Leighton Buzzard again, um, just to say that it's, it's really worth continuing to involve um, the whole church congregation. Um, it, I think it's easy to think that buildings are the domain of um, maybe a facilities person if you've got one in your church, um, but trying to keep the congregation encouraged. So some of the ideas they came up with in the middle, in the flowers here, are things like switching the lights off, turning down the heating. These are behavioural changes um, that hopefully doing the whole of Eco Church will encourage people to adopt. And turning down the heating um, might... Uh, uh, concern some of us, um, but these are changes that we will have to, I think, make in the cultures of our churches, and we may need to um, revert to um, how church, how church used to be done when people maybe still wore their coats in church, or indeed where you can have um, more directed um, under pew heating, uh, which is then directing the heat at the people instead of trying to heat the whole building. So just. Um, yeah, just, some, just a reminder really to um, keep visiting with the congregation the things that you are trying to do um, and you'll see um, they had reduced waste here which would impact on your carbon footprint, they had focus on energy saving and doing more about renewables, both of which would impact directly on your energy, uh, on your carbon footprint and then they've got praying about it um, which absolutely uh, also needs to be uh, what we are doing um, in trying to keep ourselves going um, and praying for um, other churches on a similar path to our own, other organisations, 
um, and for um, the nation as a whole as we head towards um, the government's net zero target. Uh, I just wanted to highlight this one, which again, I think I've shared at a previous webinar, um, just to say, uh, so this was compiled by a lady at St. John Baptist in uh, Sheffield um, and sort of maps out um, various documents, the Eco Church Survey in purple. I think the green ones are from the Practical Path document um, uh, that, that has been produced, the Practical Pathway document. And in the heating and lighting, you'll see many more there that are from the Practical Pathway. And these are things like investigating motion sensors for lighting. So again, we don't have a question on that in Eco Church. Um, but absolutely, if you're looking at um, switching out to LED bulbs, then it makes sense to also think about um, being efficient with when your lighting is on and off and motion sensors um, would certainly help with that. And I hope this sort of framework um, just illustrates how Eco Church plus the practical pathway documents to net zero um, plus other documents which are referred to in here, like the diocesan synod environment motion, all help um, towards the whole. That is uh, as much as I'm gonna say on buildings, um, but I hope that you um, have got a level of understanding that taking the actions in the building section of Eco Church will very much contribute towards um, reaching um, a net zero target. Uh, if you do all of those, or at least the ones that are applicable um, to your church. Land is another um, really important section, and I was um, really pleased to see this uh, in Catherine's webinar as well. Um, the State of the Environment Soil Report that the Environment Agency brought out in June 2019 says that UK soil contains about 10 billion tonnes of carbon, that's roughly equal to 80 years of annual greenhouse gas emissions um, for our country. But intensive agriculture causes arable soils to lose carbon um, and the impacts of climate change are posing further risks. Um, so, for example, ice, um, ice melt around the globe, um, permafrost melting is, is potentially releasing stores of um, greenhouse gas emissions. Same is true for us in this country when we're excavating the peat moorlands and that's why finally there's now legislation around us not using um, peat based compost on our land. You won't find that as a specific question in Eco Church, but it is, uh, I, I think, just um, hopefully emphasising that we need to look after our land and look to our land to help us also on a practical path to net zero. So how we manage our land um, does have huge implications, um, not just for carbon management, but biodiversity too, um, and also for ourselves, for our own well-being, and encouraging us um, in some of the tougher actions that we might need to take. So questions about encouraging native wildlife, um, native wildflowers, and so on. And um, again, um, from Catherine's webinar, this slide about the, um, the land aspect of a church and how we can get to a biodiverse net zero church um, we've got trees protected and new trees planted. So there is a question in the land section of Eco Church about tree planting. Um, how, are we uh, developing wildlife habitats? Um, for example, the native wildflower planting, uh, which is also there in question six. Maybe we're um, putting a, uh, having an area for veg beds and herb growing and so on. And some churches are doing that not on their own land directly, but on other community land. Back boxes, swift boxes, uh, we've got questions on all of those. So just to um, sort of reinforce really that land, um, whilst it might not directly map to you getting to net zero um, in terms of these things are quite hard to measure um, and to quantify from a carbon perspective, they are nevertheless absolutely vital um, in what we're all trying to do. Um, and broader questions here, I think, which we'll touch on briefly in community and lifestyle um, about how we source our food, uh, which will also have implications for that bigger carbon um, soil measurement that, that, I, that I mentioned. We're very nearly there. Community and global engagement, um, as I often say, it's the category that reflects that it's the poorest um, in our global society who are the ones who suffer the most. 
from our changing climate. There's perhaps less in here that's relevant to measurement in terms of net zero, but much that is relevant to motivation. Managing our buildings and our land to get to net zero carbon is probably hard work in some areas, if not many areas, but we're also not doing it on our own and we're not doing it just for ourselves. We're part of a much bigger collective of people and organisations all trying to reduce our impact on the earth. So this section is all about how we're connecting with other groups such as transition towns or wildlife trusts in our own areas, whether we're lobbying our MPs on national and international environmental issues and with COP26 on the horizon, that's something that we can all be doing now. And whether we're campaigning, so for example, uh, via Climate Sunday ahead of COP26 talks and trying to get the government to set um, also stretching targets, which will then hopefully also help to drive legislation um, that in turn might help us in our churches to make some of the changes that we want to make. So for example, the, the feed-in tariffs went from solar um, some years ago, I think, but we need, um, we need uh, to be incentivized to make these switches and for them to be um, as easy as possible for more of us to do. So whilst net zero carbon might primarily be about getting our own house in order, it's also important that we speak out in society and work with and inspire others to do the same. And it's why when we're assessing gold awards that we often um, look for how much visibility that church is giving to the work that they're doing and how much they're sharing it with other churches. So hence questions in here about green fairs, um, also um, back to the behavioural aspect again. Uh, so encouraging other users of your churches um, to uh, reduce energy usage by having notices about turning off lights and so on. Um, and then also maybe participating in, um, well, this in fact is a worldwide initiative that um, WWF started some years ago. Um, there's always a date in March each year when um, organisations and, and, and house uh, homeowners are encouraged to switch off our lights um, to show that we care about the future of our planet, our shared home. And it's a reminder that even the small actions can make a big difference. And I think that's important to bear in mind going for net zero too. I am going to flip flick over this one quickly. Um, Streetly Church, uh, Methodist Church, um, who do an awful lot of green fairs, um, but I am conscious of time. So just to say, um, you'll find questions in here about campaigning, also about meals. And just to bring us back to that um, carbon footprint measurement using the Climate Stewards tool, the 360 Carbon, um, that if we are serving meals in church, and I appreciate we've not been doing that for the last 18 months or so, um, just to look here about the, the differences um, in the carbon impact of maybe a high meat eating diet versus a vegan one. And we're not um, sort of, you know, suggesting or campaigning that everyone becomes vegan, but it's just interesting to um, bear these um, figures in mind when you're thinking about the types of food um, that you can serve uh, in your churches, if indeed you do uh, serve meals. And then finally, lifestyle. There are some questions in here um, that directly impact on our carbon footprint measurement. Um, so, for example, whether we're walking and cycling to church um, services. Um, now, sorry, I'm just <laughs> losing my place slightly. Um, now, in some respects, that would be our own carbon footprint. Um, and to, to include in a church a carbon footprint might be double counting, but climate stewards have made provision for this because it's actually one of the most e the easy and obvious things to target when looking at people's behaviour. So there is an option in there um, about measuring it and trying to encourage people to lift, share and to walk and cycle and so on. Um, and then our church funds, I'm gonna end with this question, is very significant from an overall ethical perspective um, in terms of our commitment to the bigger net zero cause. So just recently, the church in Wales um, have passed a motion um, to fully divest um, from fossil fuels uh, and they've also brought another motion that um, no investments would be made in any company de deriving more than five percent of its turnover from the production or extraction of fossil fuels um, by for that to be actioned by the end of this year 
Um, so look at where your bank accounts and investments um, are invested and think about getting those out of fossil fuels. Um, again, it won't directly impact on net zero, but a part of the bigger cause of us trying to um, collectively reduce our emissions. And then the final, uh, okay, let me just, okay, Leighton buzzard again, some of the things I'm gonna skip over that one. The final thing um, that I just want to end with really is to encourage you to make a start. Um, it might be that you're doing Eco Church already, um, go and uh, watch the webinar uh, on net zero which will give you um, again an in-depth look at what you can do with your buildings um, but get started and similarly um, if you're already doing net zero um, but can I please encourage you to to get started with Eco Church because the two uh, can work so well together um, and really complement each other uh, and I will stop there um, and allow some time brief time for questions thank you Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you, as ever. You, you covered a huge amount of ground there, a huge amount of ground. Um, so it's time for questions. We've got just under 10 minutes. If you find the Q&A, pop your question in there or mark next to someone else's question if it's uh, one that you're interested in the answer. We've got two definitional questions which are probably actually coming my way, Helen, and then a question about rabbits which I have nothing useful to add on. So you, you can think whether you have anything useful to say about rabbits. Um, so there's a question from Susan that I'm going to take first, which says, why do you only count the reimbursable fuel used? So um, this is a Church of England answer. If you're joining from another denomination, you'd have to refer to, the, to your own church. The Church of England, after General Synod passed the motion net zero by 2030, we then did a piece of work defining exactly what was in and out of scope of that target, uh, taking the standard greenhouse gas protocols about scope one, scope two and scope three emissions. And we've largely said that the scope one and scope two emissions are in scope of our target. So that means the energy used to run our buildings, the gas, the electricity, the oil, and the transport journeys that we as a church are responsible for. Um, and we have taken uh, as, a, as a pragmatic definition of that, those transport journeys that we are financially responsible for through our expenses systems, we're also responsible for the emissions from those journeys. Uh, so that's clergy travel, volunteers if they're, if they're doing, um, doing things for us, but it doesn't cover staff getting to work and it doesn't cover people um, coming and going from church services or, or from doing the school run of children to our schools. So it's those things that we're financially responsible for through our expenses system. Now, that's just that measurement issue of what is in scope of the 2030 target. It doesn't mean that we don't want to influence far more broadly than that. So absolutely, we would want to influence how people get to church through, for example, bike racks or offering EV car charging or in covering lift shares. But at the end of the day, in terms of what we're setting up our greenhouse gas reporting to measure and what we are targeted to get to zero is only those bits which are in scope of the target. And that's the reimbursable travel. So I hope that answers your question on the transport one. Uh, the next question is from Nigel, which was about measuring the sequestration achieved by the trees in our churchyard, um, which is such an interesting question. And somebody has put in the answers, has pointed towards an app I'd never even heard of called an iTree survey on a website called iTreeTools.org. So that's really, I learn every, something every time I run these webinars. Um, just to give you a quick answer on trees though. I'm going to show you one of the slides that I use in my webinar on measuring and defining net zero, uh, which is one on tree planting. Because um, I think a, a lot of people think that tree planting is just this sort of uh, perfect solution that almost that we don't need to reduce our energy use because we can plant trees, but actually it's whilst tree planting is a good thing, it's not this perfect solution. So um, this picture here, where you can see that the, the quite small person next to it, this tree, the biomass in the tree is gonna weigh about a ton in a mature tree. So in its whole life, 
it, it ends up weighing up about a ton a tree of this size and the, the chemistry is that one ton of tree is just under four tons of carbon dioxide um, so in its lifetime this big mature tree will have taken in a little bit under four tons of carbon dioxide now that varies enormously by the type of tree and by the size of tree but just you know this is orders of magnitude um, so whether that carbon is sequestered in that tree i.e permanently captured depends a lot on if the tree survives so a lot of tree planting not all the trees take if the tree survives and if it was a genuinely additional tree so you haven't chopped something else down to make room for the tree that's planting and then also looking ahead to the end of the life of that tree so over its lifetime it's captured those four tons at the end of that tree's lifetime if it either rots or burns then the carbon dioxide is released back into the atmosphere so it's only permanently sequestered if the tree is then used for something so you use it to make the rafters of a house for example or desks or something physical that means that the the wood uh, the carbon remains captured in wood um, a, a typical church has got something like it varies enormously but something like 26 tons of carbon dioxide per year so you're order of magnitude just an order of magnitude these things vary enormously is you're looking at something like planting seven new trees per year of a year to be offsetting that and it would act very slowly over the whole lifetime of that tree um sorry that was quite a long answer to that question i hope it was useful um the next question, let me flick back to the questions, which I've now lost because I put my slides up, right, Q&A. Uh, the next question is from, it's from Leslie Brown, is about, is about the rabbits. With having had time to Helen, to Helen think, do you have anything, any useful guidance to give on controlling numbers of rabbits? Oh, I must be honest, I don't off the top of my head, particularly seeing that they're digging and tunneling as well. What I am going to do is put this to our naturalists team of advisors. Um, so, Leslie, if you uh, are happy to email uh, me or the Eco Church inbox, um, and we will find try and find an answer to that question for you. Helen, can you pop that email address into the chat yeah. so that people know yeah. where they should be sending that yeah. question? And Leslie, I hope that's all right. If you send your question to to the email address Helen's about to give you and she'll come back with it. I had a quick look on the Caring for God's Acre website and I couldn't find anything about rabbits and that's normally where I would look for for anything to do with churchyard management. Um, right and then the final question here is from Hillary. It says we have the money for a water butt but our cast iron downpipes are not standard size. Any suggestions? Um, again I'm sorry I would have to say that that sounds like a getting a handyman handyman question Helen sorry yes I um I would also struggle with that one I'm wondering if our buildings advisors might be able to help um I mean there are all sorts of different styles and shapes of water butts but it sounds like the problem is the piping and actually getting the connections done yeah I think I don't have a technical, I don't know that there's a technical answer to it, maybe a handyman. Um, I can, I can ask our buildings advisors, or again, you could email us um, at that address that I've just popped in there. <clears throat> if you, if you flag on your emails um, that they're coming from this webinar, because um, we get hundreds of email inquiries, I'll try and make sure <laughs> to look out for them and we'll get them to the right place. Thank you, Helen. So that's actually the end of the questions, which is handy, given it's 1.59. Oh, oh, we've had somebody else has now answered the previous question. We too have cast iron downpipes and have been told by uh, expert that we can't have water butts. So that sounds discouraging. Well, we'll see what answer your building advisors come back with, Helen, and, and whether they have anything, anything to add. Um, so that's the end of the third of the Eco Church topics for this run. As I said at the beginning, uh, Helen's going to run all three of them again in the autumn, in September and October. 
So if you finish today thinking, oh, I wish I'd had a colleague here to listen, uh, they'll be able to either watch the video when it's up on our website or come along in the autumn. So do please tell people if you've come along to this and found it useful. Uh, and we've got all those other webinars coming up. Um, the next one is heat pumps next week, and then that whole program reaching out to December. Um, Helen, thank you so much again. Thank you for today and also for the previous two topics. It's been so useful, just all that information on how to get started, how to work towards awards and how to, to link this in with net zero. Thank you very much for your practical. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I will just save the chat so that I can send you the links afterwards. And later this afternoon, I'll send you all um, the slides and the links from the chat uh, and hope to see you at one of our future webinars. Bye everyone. Thanks Catherine, bye everybody.